So, um, as, as Anna's really kindly already mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, an aspect of the research journey that I think is a vital part of any kind of robust, rigorous research process, and that's the um, aspect of reflective practice. And Anna invited me to the presentation today because I've written about reflective practice a number of times. Um, and most um, sort of well cited is, is the work I did in 2014. And it's been something that I've been really mindful about uh, over my research career, particularly because I've primarily focused on researching particularly hidden and sometimes stigmatised population. And that's been the kind of bulk of my research. And as a researcher, critical practice is very much at the heart of what I and other researchers do, which is to critically reflect on our writing, our teaching, and importantly for this uh, session, about our research. And reflective practice is a, is a skill uh, that's encouraged when we're conducting research because it prompts us to ask questions. It prompts us to think more about our research strategies, our methodologies, our epistemological, ontological position. It encourages us to take um, a more quality-led approach to research rather than focusing on the easy route or, or speed. So it's, it could be seen, I guess, as a quality assurance or research integrity type process. And it encourages us to reflect critically on our position and positionality in research. Uh, but reflective practice is, is different from study to study. So, for example, um, some research that I've done more recently on looking at um, asking police for a request for information under the Freedom of Information Act, that's encouraged me to reflect on the process of writing and sending FOI letters to the police and the impact of my request on police officers who are legally bound to respond to a request. Compare that to the research that I've done on the sex industry, which I would argue is involved much more extensive reflexive practice because the people that I've been involved in research with have been more marginalised than the police and they face stigma in their involvement in com commercial sex. And it's this that I'm going to be focusing on today, looking at stigmatising hidden populations and, and how we need to think more reflexively about, about that process and our involvement in, in that type of research. Okay, so I've just moved that on. Can you, can you definitely see that, everybody? Can you just put, somebody put a hand up and let me know you can see that slide as well. I've just moved on. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Great. So in order to explore reflexive practice and think about its importance in the context of research, what I'll be doing in the first part of today's session is beginning to explore the concept of reflexive practice and consider why research reflexivity is so important. I'll also be considering some of the ethical issues that need to be considered when we conduct research on marginalised and stigmatised communities. And then finally, I'll be exploring some of the ways in which research can impact on personal lives, so i.e. your research, uh, your, your personal life as a researcher, and how reflexive practice needs to move beyond the research context, but also into to your own personal spheres. So what is reflexive practice? What is research reflexivity in the context of qualitative research? Well, as Rachel Shaw identifies, it is more than just simple reflection. Reflection is described as, in comparison, the practice by which researchers or professionals become more aware of their implicit knowledge base and learn from their experiences. Reflexivity differs from reflexive practice as it deals both with the personal and broader issues. Reflexivity is a, a greater awareness of the researcher's role in the practice of research and the way in which this is influenced by the object of the research, enabling us as researchers to acknowledge the way in which we might affect the research process and outcomes. Researchers may critically reflect on the subjective factors, so thinking about your own personal subjectivity, but also considering the wider contextual issues might, which might inform our research. So, for example, 
the wider social historical environment in which our research is situated. Reflexivity therefore helps us to understand the research under study. So the phenomenon that we study, we, we understand it better through research reflexivity. We understand the research process better, but also importantly, our role as a researcher and the role that the researcher participant relationship plays in our research findings. Reflexivity is also seen as a, an essential part of the, of the qualitative research pro process. And it's instead to be informed by an interpretive approach that appreciates the role of the here and now in the research context. So what is happening now, what is happening in that, in that in re research environment, what is it about, for example, the interview context that can influence our data? So it's thinking about the research context, the, the sphere in which you're based, the location, etc. So it helps us to um, reflect on our research design, our research process. It helps us to think about how our data is, is analysed, what questions we ask and what theories that we draw upon. And it does that in a, a critical way. We do that in a critical way. So in a way, I guess reflective practice is part of an evaluation process, an evaluation of ourselves to recognise our own subjective biases and how these then materialise in our own research. Because reflective practice is not undertaken um, in a vacuum. We've got to recognise that reflective practice is a means by which we then can start to mitigate or potentially, um, yeah, potentially mitigate those biases. But also for those people who are reading about our research, it enables them to understand that we're being transparent about our lack of objectivity. So being reflective, it's argued by in 2018, it improves the rigour and reliability of our research. And they argue that it's seen as a kind of gold standard for determining the trustworthiness, quality and rigour in our research. And reflective practice is therefore seen as an important part of our research design process. And according to Mitchell et al. in 2018, reflective practice can be some of the most challenging and important work in qualitative research. So it's a really important aspect of the design process, the journey that you go through in terms of research. And reflexivity encourages us to consider both the research context, and I was you know, talking earlier about the, the wider social, political, economic context that might shape, for example, um, our participants' views of the world, for example. But also we need to think about how the room, the lighting, the location, how us as interviewers can impact on data collection, for example but also how our own individual life histories can impact on data collection and therefore what we know about the topic under study. So, for example, there are often many polarised positions on things like gender-based violence or sexuality, and there are you know, polarised positions on, on these particular studies. And it's these personal perspectives and or per people's lived experiences that can influence what questions we ask, how we might interpret the data, how we might interact with our participants, how we might frame the resulting discussions in things like your thesis or in journal articles or books. So it's thus our own subjective viewpoint, our opinions about our topic and our previous lived, lived experiences that can affect the findings of our research. And it's being more aware of that, which can help us to be more transparent or potentially adopt strategies that can, can help us to minimize those biases. And it's that task that can help us to uncover those biases, to be more aware, for example, of how they might influence our data and the arguments that we make. And we know that research isn't undertaken in a vacuum, for example, and you know, it's not done in outer space. You know, we know that we too, as researchers, can be very much influenced by the social norms that are likewise influencing our participants. 
And therefore that can potentially shape how we understand our topic of study because we are immersed in the social world that our participants are immersed in and that can help us to understand their positionality or their, their perspectives. And likewise, our own life histories and individual biographies can affect how we interpret our data or the way we engage with participants. As Berger in 2015 has described, we need to be more self-aware of our relationship with the topic we study and our place in the research. And I'm just quoting uh, Berger here from 2015 when Berger states that researchers need to be increasingly, increasingly focused on self-knowledge and sensitivity. Better understand the role of the self in the creation of knowledge. Carefully self-monitor the impact of their biases, beliefs, and personal experiences on their research. And maintain the balance between the personal and the universal. I'm gonna come back to this idea of maintaining the balance between the personal and the universal and the research um, context in this sh shortly. Um, because I'm going to talk about later on how um, our personal lives can be impacted by the research process. But I'll return to that shortly. Uh, <clears throat> just following on from that, uh, Berto has argued that it's really important for researchers to be aware of our own unconscious biases as well. And I think reflective practice does encourage us to, to do that. So, for example, Virtual argues that we need to be aware of, for example, our own um, unconscious biases around racism or sexism or ageism or other isms uh, that may influence our decision making. And she explains how our unconscious cognitive biases can really influence what we find and what we could potentially do if we're not aware of our unconscious biases is we might actually fit our findings with our existing beliefs. So i.e. what we find is a reflection of what we already believe rather than a true reflection of what we found. And then reflexivity can help us to uncover those biases and try to mitigate any potential um, bias in our findings. Uh, but the, the, those biases are certainly not limited to data analysis and data when you're writing up your research findings. According to Hertz in 1997, our biases, uh, as I quote, is imposed at all stages of the research process, from the questions they ask to those they ignore, from who they study to who they ignore, from the problem formulation to analysis, representation and writing. So research, research reflexivity should be undertaken from the moment of idea inception or the germination of your ideas why were you motivated by those particular ideas why are you studying the things that you're studying why are you asking the questions that you're asking why are you informed by a particular theoretical perspective for example what is it that speaks to you and how could that then lead to an influence of your findings and being transparent about that in writing can be really really useful the people who are um, looking at your research. So research reflexo reflexivity therefore means, according to Berger in 2015, turning the researcher lens back onto oneself to recognise and take responsibility for one's own situatedness within the research context and the effect that we may have on the setting so, you know, you know the, the types of settings we pick, the locations, if we're going to undertake interviews, the uh, platforms we, we use in terms of survey design, uh, the people that we're accessing and who we're studying, the questions we ask, the data we collect and how we interpret that data. Is Berger sort of saying that we need to, as he says, turn the research lens back on ourselves. But I also think it's aware, need, we need to be aware that research isn't just a one way process and we're heavily embedded in our research in a way that we can too become impacted by our research. So what I've talked about mostly so far is how we influence the research findings, we influence the data collection process. And it's, a, it's not a one way process is kind of what um, I'm going to suggest to you today. We can be influenced by the research ourselves. And that's important when we think about research ethics, but also in terms of the support structures that we put in place for ourselves as researchers. 
So conducting research means that we, we are each involved in a reciprocal relationship with our participants, which means that personal stories can be shared. And, you know, by sharing those personal stories, it's, it's one of these uh, situations where that two way process can, can really come out. And some of these stories that we as, as researchers may share may be sensitive. They could be emotional topics. And they can have a profound impact on other researchers. So um, us sharing our experiences can have a profound impact. And likewise, the people that we speak to, their sharing, sharing of their experiences and life histories can have a profound impact on us, us as researchers. So, for example, in, in um, a study that I led on women who pay for commercial sex that I know Anna mentioned previously, I was very emotionally moved by um, a lady who rang me, didn't want to be taking part in the research because of the stigma around the subject matter. And I was really emotionally moved by how she described that she felt like a freak and she felt that she was the only woman nationally in the UK who was paying for sexual services. And it's in these discussions that I became, you know, really quite moved by that. And, and that really gave me a momentum to try to do more um, for, for women who decide to per purchase commercial sex. And, um, you know, that really motivated me. And it's really it stuck with me and resonated with me as I was kind of writing up the findings that I don't I wouldn't want anyone to feel like a freak. Um, and I, I'm certain, that's certain that woman wasn't. And it's really in discussions as well with people who had not been involved in any research that helped me understand societal views of women who pay for commercial sex. So, for example, when I've talked to people outside of kind of academic context about my research, it's very clear that some people have a distaste, if that's a word to use here, or are, um, are very negative about women who they believe are transgressing moral boundaries. And that really helped me, again, to understand the social context in which these women are situated and helped me understand why this woman felt that she, as she used the term, was a freak. And, you know, as I say, she's definitely not. Um, and some researchers as well in this, um, the sharing of life stories, um, share their lived experiences in a way to help build relationships with participants. So people can share their, researchers can share their own personal stories and have done before. So for example, Nicola Hardin's lived experiences of, of criminalization led her to share this experience, but also elements of her personal life with the women that she was researching in a women's center in the north of England. And at the time of the research, she was pregnant, and motherhood became one of the topics of discussion in the research, in part sparked by the fact that she was physically showing that she was pregnant uh, and also from women's experiences. So it's important to recognise how even things like your physical appearance can have an impact on what things are discussed, as Nicola Harding found out. Some scholars have argued that sharing these personal biographies could be associated with a lack of credibility that is motivated by people's personal suffering, as, or as some have argued, it's quite narcissistic. However, as Gemma Ahern has argued, the risks of not writing in a way that she describes is, is raw and uncomfortable is to legitimate the institutional betrayal and secondary trauma that many researchers feel. And why some may argue that researchers are too involved and lack this elusive objectivity, as Gemma describes. Not sharing our stories can mean that we fail to be transparent and could be labelled as disingenuous. So Gemma is talking about how, you know, when, when you're involved in research and maybe, you know, if you've got a lived experience, that for some people there may be questions about the academic credibility of the research if you're so heavily involved in that. The counter argument to that is obviously that it can in increase uh, potentially your access to participants, but also, as Gemma argues, that it's a useful way for us to be transparent if you feel comfortable sharing those experiences. But also, in, in terms of the impact of research on us and researchers, it's clear that research can also impact on a person's personal relationships with their romantic or life partners. 
as Natalie Hammond, who I've written with previously, has experienced in her PhD research on men who pay for sex, hearing men's stories of being unfaithful to their wives led her to question the viability of her own personal relationship, which subsequently failed and her and her ex-partner separated. So it's important for us to recognise the potential impact that research can have on us and can have on our personal lives, as well as the research context in which we're conducting our research. Researchers can also be interviewing people with significant social, political and economic power, which may place them in unequal power positions, which might result in, for example, participants being led by uh, leading, should I say, the, an interview and instead of answering research questions. And that's something that I've experienced myself when I was conducting research um, for my PhD, looking at community perceptions of, of um, the sex industry. I interviewed a number of senior politicians in a, in a north of England based city. And I was very aware um, interviewing one particular politician that my questions were being sidelined and the focus was very much on what they wanted to say. And that for me was a, a real learning journey. Um, you know, as a PhD researcher, I, I'd um, not had that experience of, of, of being so persuaded by a participant and, try, and a participant trying to lead me in terms of the questions. And I really reflected on the, I guess, some points during the interview, my inability to try and get us back on track to what I was trying to talk about. Um, and I learned from that and, and subsequently went away and reflected on what strategies I could employ to, to better prepare me for those types of, of interviews. And likewise, uh, for those who the power imbalance is more towards the researcher, and, and uh, arguably there's been um, more instances where I've been in a, a position of, you might argue, greater power in the researcher participant relationship, <clears throat> it's important that we reflect on the type of methods that we employ considering alternative methods such as participatory uh, techniques or involving members of the sample population in data collection to be, for example, peer researchers. So, you know, involving young people in the research design process, if you're, if you're conducting research on young people, or for my own research involving sex workers or those who pay for sexual services, in the design process, or, and also as, as interview, interviewers slash researchers themselves. So you might want to think about the methods that are being employed, reflecting on the potential power imbalances that might take place within the interview context, or more broadly, uh, in focus groups, um, you know, in surveys, etc. Could the language, the questions that you ask, um, mean that people don't engage in, in, in a study, for example. Many years ago, I was involved in a, a project which was looking at youth on religion. And we um, were very mindful of the types of questions that we were asking young people, because we were asking um, school aged children about their religious beliefs and views and practices. And we were very mindful of the questions that we were asking and how they were worded and involved um, practitioners and young people in helping us to develop the questions in a way that was um, would speak to young people because you know we all use terminology and language that is uh, more familiar to us and that doesn't necessarily mean that the language is accessible for our participants so again you may want to involve people in the design process of questions as, as well So just feeding on from what I was saying about um, being more aware about the impact that potentially research can have on us, it's important for us to be more aware of the sa safety and welfare uh, as, as, uh, for us, i.e. as well you, as participants, just as we are aware and reflective about the impact that our research can have on the people that we're researching. And certainly, additionally, Researcher safety is very much considered the, the researcher safety is kind of secondary to this, the, the um, safety of our participants. And I can certainly still see that resonating in um, academia today. You know, but this is my particular um, anecdotal experience. 
that it's generally seen as participants, um, the potential threat, should I say, or risk or harm to participants that's kind of more acknowledged in a lot of academic research that I've been um, or I've reviewed and less so thinking about researcher safety and hence why I'm kind of quite keen to talk about researcher safety today. Um, I think too often research and mental health and well-being is not fully acknowledged and I think university ethics processes really need to think more about the impact of any research on researchers in order to encourage us as researchers to develop strategies and support structures to prevent any harm to us, not only in the research environment, but actually more broadly in our, our personal lives. Because when we are not emotionally impenetrable robots, we're not completely detached from the topics that we study. We have feelings about the topic we study. We have experiences of conducting research that can influence how we act as researchers. And likewise, these experiences can influence our personal lives. So I just encourage people to think about how the impact of research on, on us as researchers and how that might feed into other areas of our lives. So what is involved in reflexivity? I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about some potential strategies that you could adopt in um, adopting a kind of a reflexive practice approach and there's lots of literature written about reflexive practice and there's some um, some some journal articles and some um, research textbooks that help you think about how you could employ research reflexivity and at what stages so just to start off by um, talking more broadly about what what could be employed in, in the context of research reflexivity some of Bourdieu's work is quite useful because Bourdieu talks about how reflexive process can take place in two stages or two steps. So the first step, according to Bourdieu, is that we take a step back and look at the research subject as an objective observation. So we take an objective observation of the research subject. So thinking about the research context, thinking about our participants, thinking about the research environment, the methods we choose, etc. The next step, according to Bourdieu, is to reflect on an observation of ourselves. So taking a step back and reflect on the observation itself. And we could apply this two-stage process to um, Gibbs' um, theory of reflexive practice, the learning by doing, as you can see there in the diagram. And this is a fairly simple diagram that tries to show us the simple process of reflection, reflective practice, and that you could apply that to your um, the two stages that Bourdieu identifies. Um, but it's an ongoing process, I would say. It's not just a unified or simple one-step process. As, as Gilliman and Gillen have argued, reflexivity is not a single or universal entity but a process so it's a continual process which is active it's ongoing it's at every stage of the research from the, the design and germination idea right through to the end and so this process should start according to dogson at the very start of the research journey at the very the design stage of any type of research and as dodgson describes Novice researchers can sometimes become overwhelmed by the, club, the complexity of situating themselves in the research relationship. And which is why Dodson argues that we must begin reflexivity in the very early developmental stages of research. When questions are formulated, not when a novice enters the field for the first time, as Dodson argues. So, you know, you may be, I'd imagine that people are at different stages of, of research and if you've not engaged in reflexivity yet, that might be something to think about. Um, and if you are at the very early stages, then it, it's useful to start thinking about reflecting about the questions you ask, the design and the methods you're seeking to employ at the early stage. <clears throat> there are others that argue that reflection should happen at very specific stages. So, as I mentioned before, Dodgson is arguing it should happen through all the stages. One other approach is to think about it in different stages. So, 
it's argued that there's, you could argue, we could look at this at the theoretical stage. So are you thinking about the theories that underpin our practice? The design stage, which is looking about looking at the methods we employ and the techniques such as using MViva or SPSS, but also at the practice stage. Um, and whilst this again seems like a simple three-stage process, the the, this three-stage process is much deeper than that. It's a much deeper reflection, thinking more about the data analysis, ethics, data collection stage, for example. So whilst it's a kind of simple overview of how we might go about self-reflection, actually, it's a more in-depth uh, exploration. <clears throat> and Dodgson argues that reflexivity is, is one of the those aspects of qualitative research that can only be understood truly by the experience of doing it. And I, I, I do my own personal experience that resonates a little bit with my own um, experience of doing research you know I read about research reflexivity before undertaking my PhD research um, read about it from my MA dissertation and probably on my undergraduates but I really it didn't really come to life until I'd started the research journey um, and so you may feel yourself that it's the doing the research that can really help you reflect on, reflect on your practice so it's that starting the research journey and developing your skills. You know, the, the sooner you start undertaking reflexive practice, the more you're going to develop and enhance your self-reflection skills. And things you might want to consider, according to people like Berger and Tekatal, uh, is the professional beliefs that you may have, the political beliefs you may have, your social position, your immigration status, your sexual orientation, linguistic position, personal preferences, theoretical or, or orientation, and emotional responses to, to participants. So there's many things that you could reflect on uh, when you're undertaking research. And uh, you might want to uh, go away, as I say, and, and have a look at the different types of techniques that you could potentially employ. In an attempt to understand the different techniques that researchers employ, PROPS in 2015 undertook some research with qualitative social workers to try and understand the nature and extent of research reflexivity um, from the 34 interviews that she undertook. And she was really driven by the question as to how reflexive are researchers really? Are they reflexive enough is a question that really kind of captured her, her thinking. And you can see from the diagram that's presented to you, which tries to capture some of her research findings, that you can see that the research journey in terms of reflexivity is very complex. Uh, and there's a lot that, that you may want to consider from that diagram there about how you might approach research reflexivity in, in the context of research. And others have attempted to offer a map in inverted commas of the research reflexivity journey. So, for example, the author Finlay in 2002 has identified what she calls five variants of research reflexivity. So, she, the first variant uh, she identifies is reflexivity as introspection, which is basically um, the concept is looking at yourself and your own experiences. So, that introspective view point L. The second is reflexivity as intersubjective inter reflection. And this is about exploring the multiple meanings that are emerging from the research relationship. So thinking about how uh, research can be and meaning can be situated uh, and how the research encounter is a ne negotiated process and how some of our unconscious processes can influence our relationship between our participants. The third variant is mutual collaboration. So reflecting on how we are encouraging participants to be co-researchers and how that might influence our research findings. The fourth is looking at social critique, which is exploring the power imbalances between researcher and participants, which we, we've talked about already. And the final variant is refle reflexivity as discursive deconstruction. And the basic what that means is that we pay attention to the language that we use and that we may often there may often be multiple meaning embedded in language and how that therefore impacts on the, the research findings 
the research question. And as I mentioned before, you know, when we talk about youth and religion projects, being really careful about the type of language that you use because it can be uh, misunderstood. It may well be that it's um, not clear to the participants and therefore they don't answer the question uh, that you're, you're setting. So your piloting can really help um, make sure that your questions are, are relevant. Okay, so what I want to do now is, is move on to a, from a broader discussion about research reflexivity to focus now um, and look on, look at researching um, marginalised communities, focusing, focusing specifically on sex work where I've conducted the bulk of my research. What we know about the sex industry is that in the UK it's, it's heavily stigmatised and, and also in, in uh, many parts of the world there is a lot of stigma associated with being involved in commercial sex. So those who are taking part in commercial sex are often, are often constructed as different. They're seen as different to other people. So men are perceived as perverts, as sexual exploiters, whereas women are deemed as either a whore or a victim. And the work of Goffman is, is helpful here in explaining the negativity around commercial sex, where he describes stigma as an attribute that is deeply discrediting. A person with, a, with, with or lacking a certain attribute, i.e. in the context of commercial sex, they're involved in, in sex work or the purchase of sex. These people are then categorised as less desirable and reduced to a tainted or devalued identity, i.e. a spoiled identity. And certainly in the context of my own research on community perceptions of sex work, those involved in the sex industry were often cast as other. They were seen as different to the participants that I spoke to. They were seen as more sexually promiscuous. They were deemed to be inviting sexual violence uh, and men were seen as disgusting and immoral. So arguably we can see how the stigma associated with the sex industry has an impact in terms of how they are perceived by the general public. And in addition to how um, those involved in the sex industry are perceived, Conducting research on a stigmatised topic can impact on research, but also on you as a researcher. As with the whole stigma, which sex workers often face, research can be seen as dis dishonourable and no good. So certain research to topics can be perceived as less valuable, unworthy of financial support and discredited by peers. So it's seen as some topics are seen as, as more valuable, as deserving more recognition. And it's this value or lack of impact that can impact on your research. This idea, as Lohman suggests, that sex workers are considered unworthy victims became associated with Natalie Hammond and I when we, as we argue, um, became associated with the research that we were doing when we were undertaking uh, research on the sex industry. And it led people both in the context of our research, but also in our personal lives to question the validity of someone studying what they perceived as to be an undeserving topic. So it's clear that the nature of some research topics mean that um, it may be considered to be less desirable, less valuable and less impactful than other topics. I'm just going to go into that in a, in a little bit more detail. So how did this kind of stigma that Natalie and I experienced manifest itself? Well, for Natalie and I, it manifested in a number of ways. So firstly, there are often many assumptions made about the type of research we were involved in and about the dangers we faced studying the topic and the potential threat that we experienced. So there was often the assumption that potentially we were at threat, you know, at risk of being attacked by the people we spoke to or the criminal gangs that were associated with this, this sex industry. As a result of that, we were often warned to stay away from red light areas, particularly at night. And Natalie was allowed to conduct research only on the university premises because of fear that the men that she spoke to 
uh, may in some way pose a threat to her as a researcher. And there were also assumptions made about our sexuality and sexual interests, namely because we were studying sex. Um, I think people must have assumed that because of that, we were sexually available and promiscuous. Uh, for example, um, I was propositioned by a number of participants and people that I met outside of the research environment because, of course, you know, the fact that you're, you're, you're studying a topic that was uh, about sex clearly meant that I was interested in, in the topic for sexual reasons rather than academic reasons. So there can be assumptions made about you as a researcher because you're seen as linked to the topic of study. Uh, which for, for me meant that, you know, um, unfortunately I was propositioned on a number of occasions, which you know, I'm not interested in academic research in the sex industry for that reason, only for academic purposes. But there are assumptions that can be made about, about you as a researcher. So the impact of, of sex work um, can also impact on your ability to access research groups and this is something that I experienced in my research with community groups because gatekeepers were often reticent about being involved in research about the sex industry. They were concerned about being identified in research. Uh, business representatives didn't want to be recorded and actually I think I only recorded one interview with a business representative because they just didn't want to be recorded at all. Uh, they were worried about the potential reputational damage that my research could cause to their business. So I, I could record any business representative in, in my research. Um, many were worried about the associated stigma that could come from their involvement in my, my research. And I guess some of Goffman's work is useful here in understanding that because we might argue that residents and business representatives didn't want to live in a world of stigmatised connections. So there's that assumption that in some way their business or them as people would be connected with something that's stigmatised and that stigma would transpose onto them in some way. So there was this concern from, from those who lived and worked in areas where sex work to, would take place. They were concerned that those... Um, the immorality, or as they, they were perceived in society, perceived as immorality, promiscuousness, and non transgression would be connected to them as people, and they would be considered to be deviant and immoral and promiscuous, etc. So it's that connection that causes concern and can have an impact on your ability to access participants. And it's reflecting on that and being aware of, of those potential problems that can help you mitigate some of the, the issues that you face. I mean, for example, for me, it, it meant that um, I spent three months in a, in a community centre and actually didn't do any data collection in that centre at all because of the problems with gatekeepers I have. And it meant that I had to go away and really reflect on, on my strategies. Was it me? Was it the topic? What was it that meant that I was struggling to get uh, participants and, and access those community centres? And it was through reflective practice that I recognised these challenges and how I might then go about mitigating that in the next community centre that I accessed. And I adopted slightly different approaches to try and mitigate um, some of those, those problems. Okay, so this, the stigma, as I mentioned already, um, about how our research can impact on our personal lives, the stigma that I felt as a researcher <clears throat> also can extend or did for me extend into my personal life so i myself experienced this as a, as a researcher specifically when i was a phd student and i experienced um the fact that i was often the the, the object of jokes and ridicule both in my professional capacity capacity uh, years after studying the phd but also whilst i was studying more particularly whilst i was studying i felt um, people often thought that my research was a bit of a joke and surely nobody was going to be researching this topic. Um, people often make jokes about the research and the people that I was researching. And as with Israel's uh, experience, I was often introduced as the woman studying the sex industry um, and the woman who's, who's studying sex work. And as Israel describes, she was often in introduced as Tanya. This is Tanya. And I quote here. She has a degree in sex, as if 
her association with research overshadowed all aspects of her life. And that really resonated with me in um, some of my kind of personal, the personal situations that I, that I encountered with people that I was introduced in that way. Um, you know, this is Sarah, she's researching the sex industry, that that was the only thing that people could describe about me. I'm probably not that interested, that's probably why. <laughs> um, but that was kind of the thing that people would often int introduce me as. <clears throat> and when I wasn't the brunt of jokes as a PhD student, what I also experienced was that I was often the focus of people's frustrations. Um, people, I remember one account on holiday where people just felt the need a couple of occasions to vent their annoyance at me and their opinions and their viewpoints about the sex industry and how they thought it was um, disgusting and that they felt it should be eradicated. And, um, and people would often tell me what the, they thought, but there was rarely any, a, 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 a space for debate or any critical discussion from from me uh, and at times you know as a PhD student I felt very inexperienced to tackle such scenarios I didn't really know at that time how to um, enter into those debates it was for me uncharted territory to be verbally I guess not attacked but to be the 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 focus of someone's frustrations about a particular topic and you yourself might feel that you because the nature of what you're researching can be the, the, the focus of that debate or discussion on that particular topic. Um, and so hence why I'm happy to talk about that today, because I, I would like other PhD students or researchers to be aware that that might happen um, in your own personal life, that people might become aware of your topic and therefore feel the need for whatever reason to vent their frustrations at you about that particular topic. And it's developing strategies that can help you uh, deal with those situations that can be really useful. So as a result of my experience, <clears throat> or my inexperience, as I thought I might add, uh, to manage these uh, situations as a, as a naive, I guess, PhD student, what I did was I unconsciously at the time adopted techniques described by Goffman in that I began to manage the information that was presented about me in social settings. So I chose instead to be uh, introduced um, as somebody who was researching gender or sexuality, so less so about the sex industry, a more broad topic. I decided to withdraw from debates and arguments about the topic because I felt there was no true debate going on when I was a PhD student. I felt that people were just wanting to vent their anger at me rather than actually engage in a critical debate or discussion about the topic. So I sought to no longer be cast as different and distinct from other researchers because that's how I felt. I felt that people were seeing me as so different to everybody else that they needed to talk about the research in that way. And so I tried to manage my identi uh, identity and employ stigma management strategies to minimize the risk of stigma. Uh, and that's kind of how, as a PhD student, I tried to, to manage uh, those situations. And as Goffman describes, people deal with their discredited character by concealing behavior, as I did, uh, deciding whether or not to display or not to display, depending on the context, the people and your own sense of self. And I was really careful about how I presented myself to others, how I talked about my research, and at times decided to state that I was studying and very little more. So I was very careful in terms of managing those social situations in my personal sphere. Um, and that helped me to understand the topic of study because it was those, those kind of personal social situations that also helped me to understand the positionality of people I was talking to, why they want, didn't want to be involved in the research, why they didn't want to be interviewed, why they didn't want to be recorded, why they decided to ring me and, and never be, they would take part in a study. I experienced some of the stigma that they experienced as being involved in the sex industry. And it really did help me to understand the, the context of my research. So where am I now, many years on from the PhD? Um, <clears throat> and a time when I wrote about the feelings of stigma as a researcher. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm still times introduced by the topic of my research, but it's generally more about intrigue rather than ridicule, and whether that's a reflection of the change in social context, it may well be. Um, 
that said, I recognise that, you know, the circles that I situate myself now are, are th such that the people who know me and have known about my research for some time. And so the jokes are probably long in the tooth. Uh, but I think it's also important to emphasise that the whilst I feel that like I've experienced some of the stigma I uh, from associated with the sex industry, you know, I'm, I'm in a very privileged position and, and I've not experienced the same levels of stigma that sex workers experience and those that I've spoken to. And I certainly wouldn't want to belittle their experiences with mine in any way. What I want to do is, is just share the experiences with other PhD students because I think it's important to think about the potential risk to us in our personal lives. Um, and at a time of my PhD, the ethics training didn't prepare me for, for the, the experiences that I had and the encounters that I faced. And so I feel that I, that I should share these experiences and also talk more broadly about reflexive practice. In addition to that, um, I'm currently also grappling with some of my own lived experiences in a field of research that I'm currently working on. Um, I'm more than happy to share my lived experiences, but I am really mindful about the repercussions it has for my family, my daughter and my partner. Uh, and the stigma associated with sexuality such that as a researcher, I feel that I've got to carefully reflect on what I tell and what I don't tell. Um, so I'm currently, you know, where I am now is grappling with some of my own lived experiences and whether I should share or disclose or, you know, as Goffman talks about, manage the potential stigma that I would face in sharing those experiences. Okay, so what I wanted to do now is um, spend a little bit of time um, giving you the opportunity to, to talk about your own experiences of research reflectivity or actually encourage you to think about your own particular views, experiences of uh, research just thinking about what I've talked about today and also kind of where you are in terms of your research journey so what I was wanting to do is to, to set up some breakout rooms and I might need Anna's help for this part um, set up some breakout rooms to talk about your experiences as a researcher and I recognize that for some of you you might be a position where you're not wanting to talk about research reflexivity you might just want to talk about where you are in your research it may be some of you are at very early stages of the research journey and you're just thinking about where you are in terms of your positionality. I think just starting to have those conversations, whilst they might not be developed and often they're not uh, at the very early stages, I think it can be really, really helpful for you to sort of take stock of where you are. Um, you may be encouraged to, for example, develop field work notes, which I did throughout my, my PhD. Or you might want to take audio clips of some of the things that your experience is. You might want to track the whole journey from start to finish, which I know uh, one of our former PhD uh, peers did, Anna, um, Mark Edwards, who he wrote his PhD based on the notes that he developed throughout the whole PhD. So I thought we would start off by doing, um, getting some breakout rooms to have a chat about your own personal experiences of research reflexivity, how you feel the moment undertaking your research. Maybe you're at the starting point, maybe you're later on. What impact do you think the research has had on you as a person or a researcher? Internet problems, so I thought that sometimes sharing the screen might make that more challenging. I think there was a comment from somebody from group one, so thank you, Martina. Um, I'll just, I hope it's okay, I'll just read out the comments from Martina in group one. Um, just said that they were discussing research which is sensitive and how um, they use their reflexivity to assure that participants are protected from unintended harm about reflexive finding dissemination. And they were also discussing the relationship between research reflexivity and objectivity of our research and data collection. And I was in group one and we were talking about potentially how did, how objective can you be? And I was just mentioning that um, it came up in my viva about objectivity and subjectivity, <clears throat> because at the time, I, I guess I, I felt more confident than I probably am now <laughs> so I felt that I was much more objective whereas now I kind of look back and think actually I was much more subjective than I really recognized at the time and again I guess for me being as I see myself now somewhat more um, unexper inexperienced um, I, I wonder whether we can tr truly ever be objective and actually what I think is the best thing to do 
and others like Gemma Ahern, etc., think that if we are transparent and we're very clear about our potential biases and our pot potential um, subjectivities, that that means that where we can mitigate that potentially, or we can just be more transparent about that that process. So yeah, whether we can be truly objective is debatable and something we were just discussing in uh, group one lived experiences and how that can Im impact on your research findings and I know um, I'm pretty sure Nicola Harding because she finished a PhD quite recently and I know um, other researchers who got lived experiences um, or come from as they identify themselves as a convict criminology group they mm -hmm. have written their kind of reflexive, reflexive statement at the outset because their research has been framed by their lived experience yeah. So for Nicola, you know, her research is very much informed by her own lived experience of being um, in a women's centre as part of her community punishment. And so she kind of narrates that from the outset because she was very much influenced and motivated by her own personal lived experience. So it's, I guess it's a question of where you think it fits best and your supervisors will will advise uh, where they think it fits best. But as I say, you may be having that grappling with that right up until the end, as I'm sure Anna was, and I know I was, about which is going to go in which section. Yeah, thank you for that, Richard. You, you raised some really um, important points about, firstly, about the Balancing Act. And I think it is, it is very challenging throughout the research journey that you always are kind of grappling with your decisions about what to disclose if you, you've got lived experience. Um, what questions to ask and how to ask those questions and I think being reflective helps you to I guess address those problems or challenges and confront them because being ignorant to them means that you're not going to be able to surmount them I guess or, or, or deal with them head on and I think often there aren't always a right and wrong answer and it's a decision that you make that potentially has consequences you've got to think through you know what are the potential consequences of sharing for example lived experience and it's something that I'm grappling with with at the moment in terms of my own um, lived experiences and whether to share those um, to more broadly and it certainly for me has helped gaining participants for a particular study I'm working on and it might not have, been, I not might not have been able to get the participants had I not exposed or disclosed my lived experience. But at the same time, you're absolutely right that potentially sharing that might influence uh, the findings. But it could influence it in a positive way. People might yeah. be more likely to disclose um, the, their their experiences. So, for example, this the study I'm talking about. I took somebody else with me who didn't have lived experience for a follow-on interview and the participants were much more closed. They didn't want to talk. They were very much more um, careful about what they said because they knew there was somebody in the room that wasn't, didn't have their lived experience and therefore they thought couldn't understand me. So it does have, it can have some positive impacts, but again, the negative could be that it does lead people down a path that they might not have envisage you would talk about and it's about being aware of that and how you might therefore mitigate those through various strategies and I think it's just being transparent about that process particularly for your PhD and talking about that is really really important about the problems that you had about the challenges that you faced and then how you went on to to respond to those challenges and I think that just makes you as a, a researcher being able to recognize that research isn't perfect it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be problems and challenges, and it's recognizing those and reflecting on those, and therefore then saying, put my hand up and say, you know, I really wanted to be able to do X, Y, and Z, but unfortunately, because of the nature of the research, I was only able to do this, and this is the strategy I employed because of X, Y, and Z. And it's just showing that you're you're a critical, reflective researcher, that which is much better than being somebody who's ignorant of um, those complexities. So I think that's the best approach to take. And you mentioned about um, online interviewing and people not um, but being being um, on camera or they not being on camera, you not being on camera. I think, you know, with particularly with any hidden population, that was something that cropped up in the research that I've done in the sex industry time and time again. People didn't want to be viewed. I remember I had one lady who, <clears throat> she was a, a female client of commercial sex and she was happy for me to see her but she didn't want to be audio recorded I'm not sure why she wanted to do it in that way but you know, there are people who just don't want to be recorded visually don't want to be recorded audio, audio 
uh, in auditory format. And we've got to appreciate their, their needs if they don't want to be identified or they're just not confident or comfortable being in those settings. So I think it's important for us as researchers to to recognize that our, you know that we've got to sometimes adapt the research environment for our participants. So my PhD research, which I've not talked about today, um, which Anna may remember me talking about at the time, I, I developed um, I developed vignettes into an audio narrative, what I, what I call kind of audio vignettes, because I used to work as a youth community worker many years ago, and I was very aware that the participants that I was going to be focusing on potentially didn't want to read or were unable to read. They didn't want to, they didn't want to be um, sat in a discussion room in the same format as we might have a, as an interview fo focus group setting. So I had to adapt my methods to my group. And so what I did was I developed vignettes into an audio format because people just didn't want to be asked direct questions about what do you think about the sex industry? And that was such a direct question that put a lot of people on the spot. That I thought, I can't do that in those types of environments. People will feel um, uneasy answering those questions. So what I did was I developed vignettes, which basically were a short story about um, the sex industry. Got actors to act out those in an audio format. And I used those audio vignettes as a way to stimulate discussion. And try to think, you know, how best to access the participants' viewpoints without making them feel uncomfortable, without putting them on the spot. Um, I found that that was kind of acting as a third party. So rather than I asking those direct questions, it enabled people to talk about things as a kind of third party. Oh, that particular person was talking about this, and then they talked about their own personal experiences. So I think you're right in terms of, um, you know, if people want to be offline. And don't want to enga engage in an online discussion i think we should um try to uh, you know support people as best we can if they want to take part in re research oh, i've just got a question here from um, one of the groups somebody was asking um does research reflexivity um emerge in our data analysis or elements of it i would say yes i think you know when you're when you're engaging in analysis i think that it's you know you, the way that you analyze your data um, will be influenced by your own positionality potentially, or it might be influenced by the theories that you draw upon. I mean, you're thinking about, you know, when the different strategies that we employ to find data or find um, citations or find literature, we might all adopt slightly different practices to try and find academic literature. And so that is informing our analysis of the data if we've got a particular pool of, of, of a body of literature. And similarly, we think about analysing your data, you know, what words do you pick up on? What quotes do you focus on? Why is it that you focus on a particular theory? So I would encourage you to definitely to, to continue reflexivity throughout the data collection and analysis process, because I think, you know, our biases potentially can come out, come out there. Does anybody else want to um, raise things that you were talking about in your, your groups? Or have you got any other questions you'd like to ask? Um, before we close, I realise we've got 15 minutes left, but if anybody has any questions, Anna, I don't know if I'm missing any questions. Yeah. No, I, want to ask a, I wasn't to ask a question, Sarah, but I didn't want to, <laughs> to if anybody else has got a question, but, but if anybody else has got questions, please put them in the chat. No, I just wonder whether you could reflect a bit more on this, on your own, on how the stigma transfers to you. I found that quite fascinating. I never saw it as your colleague, really. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I, I felt that um, your research was much more interesting than mine. Uh, mine was always boring. And I adopted similar uh, strategies to you about talking about my research because I felt they had the stigma that it was boring. <laughs> so I would just say, well, I'm doing research in the NHS <laughs> because nobody really is interested about hospital discharge planning but you know when i've done things on a stigma in the past there was this sense about the stigma of the other transfers to you so for example mm -hmm. if you're the partner of somebody with hiv yeah um you get the stigma it's on, even if you don't have hiv you see you know, somebody who is hanging around with somebody with hiv and that's stigmatizing so um yeah how, how is this something that you think it happens across every type of of stigmatized thing or is this more like with 
stigmatized areas, or is this more related with areas that are seen as promiscuous, infectious, and that kind of stigma? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, a really interesting and useful point, Anna, because I've, I've, I've been involved in research that's not been around the sex industry and certainly didn't experience the same sorts of responses that I did when I've been conducting research in the sex industry. And I guess, um, I guess the broad field of sexuality, because I've read about researchers' experiences of studying sexuality very broadly, there seems to be assumptions made about people who are interested in any type of sexuality research. And I think it's the, the this notion of sex, that it's um, sex generally seems to um, lead to those sorts of assumptions. But also, I know, pe I know people who do research on drugs as well, who likewise, there are assumptions made about their behaviour. Um, maybe it's the, the deviant, inverted commas, element that's associated yeah. with those types of research that leads people to make assumptions about people's character. Um, um, but as I say, you know, in certain, certain fields where maybe there isn't the same level of stigma and, and some of the research I've been involved in, like the Youth on Religion Project, nobody said to me anything about um, my religious positionality or what I thought about the project. Um, when I've conducted research on education, no one's made any assumptions about the research on education or the topic under study. It seems to be more focused on research around sexuality. Well, another question, by the way, in the, in the chat. I've just seen it. Yeah, I guess um, just think, thinking of, on from what you were saying about um, the stereotypes associated with particular types of people involved in, in research, research. So I know from some um, men who've conducted research in the sex industry, there have been assumptions made about their particular interest in researching sexuality, which is a very different assumption to the yeah. women that I know who've been involved in sexuality research. It's been assumed that the men are just, I guess, perverts in a, in a short way to describe them, whereas yeah, women yeah. are more sexually promiscuous. So they're often, it's often linked to particular stereotypes that permeate in society about men and women's uh, behaviour. And likewise, as you say, if, um, assumptions are probably made about me as a, a woman researching religion rather than somebody who was maybe uh, from a different, who was... Um, who is a man, for example, who's researching religion or a young person or somebody who's old. So I think people make assumptions based upon your gender, your age, your sexuality, associated with any type of research topic. I think you mentioned before about mental health research. I've been, I've been sort of slightly involved in some research around mental health uh, associated with the police. And again, assumptions just weren't made about my mental health or about the mental health of people who were also involved in the research team. I think there was just, an, I don't know if there was an assumption that we were just genuinely involved, I don't, I don't know, but didn't seem to have the same sort of response. Uh, but I guess you might argue that in the current society, uh, there really seems to be a greater recognition of people's mental health. Compare that with sexuality, and there still seems to be some stigma yeah. around certain sexual practices in society. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And the issue you mentioned um, at the start about the, the how gender might influence people's disclosure, um, that's, as I say, certainly came up with the Women Who Buy Sex project. I think that the women we spoke to would have been more uncomfortable speaking to a male researcher disclosing some of the things that they disclosed. Um, so yeah, I completely understand that. And, and as I say before, you know, other aspects can influence whether someone discloses or not, whether that be lived experience, whether that be you disclosing your, your knowledge, whether that be sharing personal aspects of, of your personal life. You know, Nicola Harding talked about how she talked about her own motherhood <clears throat> and how that then, then helped other participants to then have a discussion about their personal lives. So these things can have an impact on the research findings and it's important to reflect on that as you've, you've all um, disclosed today so thank you very much for that for that discussion as well about that so I've just I've got a question here from Karina um, apologies for not seeing this sooner Karina I just wondered about your experiences with accessing stigmatized communities this came up in our group um, yeah so you were just asking there about my experiences of accessing stigmatised communities. I'll, I'll just talk very briefly about the Women Who Buy Sex project, and I can talk about the 
my PhD, um, but I'll talk a little bit about the Women Who Buy Sex Project, just because I guess from the res all the research that I've involved in, that was probably the most challenging. And the reasons for that relate to the fact that um, generally the sex industry has been stigmatised. Um, it's hidden generally, um, although sex workers, it's great to see are more vocal now in the uh, sharing their stories. Um, but because of the nature of the sex industry being heavily stigmatised and also coupled with that, the fact that we were focusing on women who pay for commercial sex, who have been massively overlooked in policy, practice, in society more generally and academic research, they were so difficult to access. What we found with male clients is they um, will access specific online spaces. So there's a specific forum where uh, male clients primarily, I don't think I've seen many female clients on there or women clients on there, they, they access a certain forums, which I know pre previous researchers have utilised those forums and those online spaces to access male participants. Women don't frequent those place, places. We knew that women were out there, um, but we were struggling to find how we would go about accessing those very hidden research population. So what we did was we kind of adopted a kind of multi-level approach where we, um, we sent information out to our networks, which included various forums for sex workers. Um, we contacted some of our sex worker participants to see whether they would be willing to share information about our study. Um, we sent letters to various sexual entertainment venues to see whether they could send details of their, the study out to their um, users. And then the final thing we did was we went to the national press. So I wrote a press release back in 2000 and I think it's 14 or 15 now, and then did a couple of appearances to try on the, on the media and the sort of radio to try and encourage people to come forward. And actually that did make a bit of a difference. We think we got maybe a 25% increase in the number of participants who came forward from the media release, press release. And it was at that point where the lady who rang me and said that she felt, um, as I mentioned before, as a freak, that's when she, she contacted me after the press release. So we really thought <clears throat> um, long and hard about how we would try to access such a tricky population because they just, they weren't going to street sex scenes, or that we know of. They weren't uh, going to indoor um, brothels or massage parlours, etc., that we were aware of. And we, we'd spoken to um, various networks about whether they knew that women were accessing these venues and they, to our knowledge they weren't. And so we just knew they were out there. And it's about how do you therefore access a group of women that's just out there nationally? They weren't using the normal spaces that male clients would, would frequent. They weren't accessing kind of physical public slash private venues. So where about how do we get to these women? And it was then we had to think about different types of approaches. Um, ones that we weren't um, used to adopting in the past. So I think um, in accessing stigmatised communities, you just have to think slightly outside of the box is what I would say in trying to access those populations. <clears throat> so, so I hope that answered your question. If not, please uh, do feel free to come back to me, Karina. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong there. So you're just saying about, um, remember worrying about looking too lesbian and feeling that it would make you make you unapproachable regarding women's issues um so i guess it was probably about reflecting on you know your sexuality and what people how people might perceive you, your sexuality that certainly as i say came up in um my own research where um participants um uh, did proposition me on a couple of occasions and outside of the research encounter as well in my personal experience um people uh, made assumptions about my sexuality, just thought that I was sexually promiscuous and up for anything really. Um, I was quite shocked by the number of disclosures that came my way after I would shared my research field. I mean, people, I remember one, one of my neighbours decided to share that he was into water sports and um, went into graphic detail about what he was really interested in and um, the type of things that he was up for. Um, I was propositioned by other people that I knew um, in various contexts because th people just made um, assumed things about me and my sexuality. It was very awkward on a number of occasions, Maya, um, but I think it, you know, um, 
I guess I'm more experienced now in sort of dealing with those situations. But, you know, as a PhD student, you know, with, with, with a couple of participants, it was really difficult, you know, and I just wasn't prepared for that. No, I was going to say, Sarah, I, th I remember us discussing some of these things those days, but um, I just wonder whether it would be interesting for our students to share what kind of technique do you use? Did you ignore it? Did you confront it? Did you laugh? You know, you said you weren't prepared, but what did you do and how would you do it differently now? When, if you yeah, still? so... Um, I'll, just, I'll just give you an example of one was a fairly senior police officer at the time, serving police officer, and um, mainly, well, that's, that's, probably, even, that's even more, that's probably <laughs> more difficult, Sarah. It did okay. make it challenging. I remember it now, um, yes. Yeah, um, so uh, it was the, the proposition was by a either email or text message, I can't remember what the, for, the, the, the way it was um, sent to me now. Um, but I responded and just sort of said at the time, thank you so much for taking part. Um, I'm not really interested in that type of thing. This is I'm doing this for academic reasons. I'm in a committed relationship. I'm not I'm just I tried to be nice about it. And I think actually looking back now, I probably would adopt a similar approach that I did, which is basically to say thank you for so much for participating. I'm not interested in that type of um, relationship with you. This is purely a professional relationship. This is about academic study and my PhD research and not about anything else. Um, so I just think, you know, thinking about, for me, affirming that to those people so that when they, when they come to other researchers who are researching that topic, that they don't make the same assumptions about them. And that's kind of what I was thinking of when I was responding to those people. Yeah, I mean, I did have a final slide, but I realised that a lot of people were to go, which is just to really sort of conclude on a, a few thoughts, which is just to, as I, I guess, conclude and summarise some of the things that I've talked about and we've discussed in our chats today, which is just to say that uh, reflexive practice obviously needs to be involved in the research process, but also we need to think about how it can potentially impact on our personal everyday lives. Um, and obviously, as well, I've kind of reflected on my own kind of um, physical and emotional distance from the research as I'm reflecting now, because um, mm -hmm. when I wrote the article about reflective practice back in 2014, and I was actually talking about the research, my research experiences, they are very different to how I am now. And I think that distance does help to, um, to help us to better reflect and also develop strategies for future research. Um, and I think, just to also kind of highlight that research that's on a sensitive topic, topic can bring challenges and I think it's just important for us to recognise that, that so that we can better prepare ourselves for future research encounters. That's great. Well, thank uh, you just, so much, Sarah. Sorry, what are you going to say, Sarah? No, 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 it's just that I've got some other questions. So but I, I'm happy to close now and then um, answer some questions that are still in the chat box. Yeah. yeah. I just feel a responsibility because I just didn't feel myself as a PhD student. I wasn't prepared for a lot of the things I encountered. And, you know, it was through discussions with people like you, Anna, and, you know, other people that we were studying alongside at the time that I was able to then sort of respond to a lot of the challenges that I faced. But I just, you know, naively, I probably think now, I was just not prepared for it. Well, you did a good job of it, Sarah. Yeah, so, I mean... When I was a PhD student, as I say, um, I found that really, really difficult. Um, I think it was probably, I, I don't know if it was the sort of the data collection year or just before when I, when I experienced a number of occasions where people just, just ranted at me. Um, they felt the need to just get their opinions out. And I, there was no space for critical discussion at all. So at the time, I decided to take myself out of those um, situations because I just didn't think that there was any constructive discussion to be had and people didn't want to listen to what I had to say. Now, um, I do encounter those uh, debates on a more regular, uh, oh, sorry, not on a more regular basis, but now I do encounter those sorts of discussions but I do feel that I've got much more space to engage in critical discussion with people. I don't know whether that's because I'm a little bit more experienced or whether society has changed a little bit more. Um, you know, I, I see t sex workers much more active on places like Twitter, much more vocal around. I mean, a sex worker that I, I know um, has been on daytime television a number of times and she's been on TV and things. So... I, I don't want. I don't do wonder whether society is starting starting to change a little bit and its position around the sex industry. 
or whether it's that um, I'm a little bit more experienced to deal with that because I recognise that as a PhD student I just wasn't, I was totally out of my depth. I remember years and years ago when I was a, um, a PhD student and, and um, I'd gone to a conference, conference and Jeffrey Weeks was presenting, I don't know if people know Jeffrey Weeks' work, and at the time he was presenting his, um, a, a bit of a presentation about his book, The World We Have Won, and God, he got, I mean, I mean, I, you know, my Jeffrey Weeks' work, and, um, you know, he's, he's written extensively about the history of sexuality, and, you know, he's been my go-to for many, on many occasions, and whilst I don't agree with everything that he's written, um, you know, he got such a hard time in his presentation, and I sat next to him at the com on the, and after the conference and says, how do you cope with that? And he just said, it never, ever goes away, and you just have mm -hmm. to accept that you'll always be challenged in this sort of way it's just preparing yourself yeah. for that and I, I remember thinking god it's not just me who's feels quite <laughs> nervous he, he's, he admitted to me you know it is really challenging and I do feel on the spot and it is quite nerve-wracking and so it did make me feel a lot of, a little bit better as a PhD student that I wasn't the only one who was um a little bit unnerved by the challenge that I got in your research findings and the research topics that you're involved in.